Okay, hey, welcome back to Programming Through Mobile App Development. Today, we are doing the demo, conceptual demo for uh, JavaScript, finally. We're getting into the programming side of things. So, uh, let's see. I'm As always, I'm going to try and start from scratch-ish. Uh, I'm going to pop open Visual Studio Code. That's the one that I've recommended to you last time, and I will continue to do so. Uh, did it open? Are we opening? Hello? There we are. Man, it's taking it a minute. My system is probably upset that I'm recording. Okay, so it, it actually popped right open to the last folder I had open, but let me let me close it just to remind you how to do that. Uh, I've actually forgotten how to close a folder. Are you the one? No, I don't need your release notes. No, thank you. Um... You know, we'll just, it, to do this, you would do file, open folder, and you would pick the folder you want to work from, right? Pick your workspace first, make your workspace, etc. cetera. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm working right in here for now, and we'll just pop it open. Okay, so, gotta hush my phone. Um, okay, so I have some notes, as always. Um, I have some things I want to want us to to muck around with. I say muck a lot, uh, um, and you know, just kind of walk through the basics of how to get yourself familiarized with JavaScript and some new some new ideas along the way. Um, I also have a couple of examples I want to I want to pull us through after we've done a few of these things. But let's just get started with the basics, okay? So, Chrome opening a new window, and we're not even going to use any. Um, not even going to use a, a, a file yet, right? All I want to do to start is introduce you to, in an interactive sense, uh, the interpreter. Let me make this a little smaller. And because this guy, I'm going to do Command Option I. Uh, I'll show you a few different ways to do this. Uh, so Command Option I is like the, the shortcut version. You can right click any page and click Inspect. And that'll usually take you to the Elements tab of the inspector. And you can also, I think it's view, developer, at least in Chrome, uh, inspect elements. Or you can jump straight to the JavaScript console. Ooh, that's nice. Uh, let's see, window, or not Windows, uh, command option J will take us right to the JavaScript console. Yay, that's where we want to be. So, um, you know, I'm just on the main Google page, but here we are. We're in a JavaScript interpreter. Uh, remember, this is our friend that allows us to do simple things like give instructions to the interpreter to run JavaScript commands. Now, as you've just seen, I did five plus six. That's eleven. Yay! That's a simple. Um, that's a simple combination of two numbers using the plus operator. You know, classic math. Um, and I just want to cover what the basic data types are, right? So we got numbers. Uh, we have true and false. Is it capital? No, I think it's lowercase. Yeah, capital. No, it, it corrects it for you. Okay, but lowercase false is the is the token. So okay, we have three. Remember from the from the previous uh, content. We have three super primitive types of information. We have Booleans, which is, this can either be true or false, a one or a zero, a yes or a no. True is one value, false is another. We'll get into how to use those in the future. Just want you to be aware of them for now. We also have numbers, 10, 10 is 10, great, 10.5, uh, that's allowed as well. 10.5.5, uh, it doesn't like that. Um, it, so essentially it, it's not just anything goes here, right? It, it is taking apart each one of the things that you're separating by spaces in these commands and saying, okay, what is this? I'm going to evaluate this. I'm going to do something with this. In this case, it's got a 10. It knows what to do with that. It's got 10.5. It knows, okay, that's a number value with 10 and a half. This is not a number. That's more of like a version, <laughs> uh, number you might see somewhere. And so it, it says, hey, that's an error. I don't know what that is, right? This is foreshadowing to this is how you begin to debug. You, If you know what errors exist and you know kind of what the system will tell you about those errors 
and it'll even show you where the error happened. Um, VM235 is virtual machine, so the, the thing running inside the browser, and line one is just the line that we put here. So if I did something else weird, like five plus six, but then I have a new line, five plus seven, and then an even another new line, yeah, I'm hitting shift enter to do that, uh, 5.5.10. You see how it says, oh, well now we're, we had an error happen at line three. That makes sense, right? I had a regular thing happening here, find thing happening here, an error happened here. Okay. So that's that's we've we've dwelled too long on on errors. We'll, we will keep coming back to that as we continue uh, the process. But these are the ideas, right? So the, we've we've seen some boolean stuff. Let, we've seen a little bit of of numbers. Let's do some more math to numbers. So five times thirty, we get our hundred and fifty. You know, if you ever need a calculator and you're mucking around inside of a, a web browser, you can just pop this right open real quick. It can do most of the things that you're interested in doing. Um, what else do we got? Uh, other operators that are of interest. 30 minus 5. We got 25. Oh, 30. That minus is odd. 30 minus 5. Usually you want to separate operators by space, but uh, it can figure certain things out. Continuing on, we can do 30 times 5. 150. Nice. Uh, and we can do 30 divided by 5 and get our 6. Um, notice how it's it's... It's always previewing what we're about to enter, which is just a nice feature of the of the console, right? So 40 divided by 5, we get 8. Okay, great. And when you hit enter, it actually runs it. It doesn't just preview it. So that's numbers. And let's also just show off some strings. Hello. Okay, so the string hello is a string. Hello. This is a subtle little nuance you might want to pay attention to. I typed hello the string using double quotes. You can use either double quotes or single quotes to represent strings in this language. One nice thing about that is that sometimes you want to have a string that actually contains quotations, right? Uh, either you're trying to quote something more accurately or you are, you're like running code that has other strings inside of it through a string. So if you want to represent uh, a string within a string, then you can say you, you, you would alternate between them. So he said, hello. And then that's, that is a string that contains a substring. Let's try and do that without, uh, alternating between them. He said, hello. You see how now We've got, the, the system has, it's going to get a little confused. It's going to explode. And here's why. This, it says, ah, that's a string. I found a quote. A, a, I found a double quote. I found another double quote. Everything between that is a string. Um, now it's going to say, oh, hello, exclamation point. Is that a variable name? Let's hit enter. Yeah, unexpected identifier. That's what the system sometimes calls variables, right? I'm saying instead of, Hello. No, what is that? Why did it go that way? <laughs> it auto-completed something for me. Let's just do hello, enter. Hello is not defined, right? It doesn't understand because we haven't defined a variable named hello. We haven't, we haven't done anything with it. It has to be inside of a string, quotes, for it to work. And again, so if I want to include string, so he said hello, um, or he said hello. Again, as long as you are properly alternating between single and double quotes for, for different you know, levels of embedded strings, it'll work fine. It comes up in a few places. Okay, so strings, other things we can do with strings. We can, we can concatenate strings. Um, hello plus world is hello world. Now, why is there no space there? You, the human, probably reading this thing, well, that shouldn't those have spaces? That seems like a natural way to do that. It does seem like a natural way to do that because that's how we are used to working with text content as human beings. But this system, all it got was these five characters, H-E-L-L-O, and then these five characters, W-O-R-L-D. It didn't get a space character. So it just jammed them together. 
it does concatenation. Now, let's jump forward into the idea of variables so we can do some interesting things with some of these primitives, right? Um, you know, I'll even reload the page so we can get a clean, a clean look. Okay, variables, right? We've, we've discussed all these things, but I just, I like to give a quick recap of the ideas again, right? A variable is a, is a bucket, it's a space, it's a box, it's a place with a label that you can store whatever the heck you want in it. So let's say I want to store a number in a variable. So var x. Now you can go ahead and assign things to this or you can just declare it. You can declare it at the top. Now what's inside of x? Undefined. I, I declared the variable so the system doesn't explode like when I just type hello on its own. But it it's, doesn't have anything inside of it, right? If I want something to be inside of it, I use the assignment operator. So x equals 10. Now it's been declared, x equals 10, we get 10. All right. This is a way to mess around with um, with combining information that you can input. So var y equals 20, right? So again, we can declare the variable on its own or we can declare it and assign it at the same time. Everything's good in those those regards. So, x plus y, we got 30, great. Um, now, what if I want to continuously add something to a variable? I want the variable to keep track of something, right? So, what you can do is, let's say I'm, I'm gonna give x a new variable, and we're going to keep adding numbers to it, right? We're gonna keep adding 10. So, x is already 10. What I can do is x equals whatever is in x right now, so 10, plus another 10. Okay, x equals 20 now. Uh, it, by the way, you can go, you can hit up and down in the console to, to rerun previous lines. It's very useful. You, it lets you edit them before you run them too. If I just keep doing this, same execution over and over, you see that x is growing, right? We are sort of iteratively adding something to x. Again, this is great. We have, we've declared this space where we wanna keep track of something, like a counter. And as things happen, time goes on, whatever happens on our page, we can keep incrementing that counter up and up and up and up and up. Uh, so, we can do a similar thing with, um, with strings. So, Let's see. Let's do a string. I'm going to change y to a string. Um, ha the names of my cats. <laughs> okay, now why would I arrange it like this? Well, now I can do a same kind of operation and keep adding names to this list, to this list, the string. Uh, I can do y equals y plus some new cat name, George. You all know my cat's name is a little bit. I'm just gonna skip that part and we're gonna keep adding names. Okay, names of my cats. We've just added George. We can add Carlos, <laughs> my cat Carlos. Uh, we can add my cat Gina Davis. <laughs> you see what I'm doing? I am taking something that was in a variable and continuously updating it by adding new information to it, right? And the way that functions exactly is, I say, hey, y is going to get a new value. That, you know, that's what the equal sign means. I'm going to assign a new value here. And what's the new value going to be? Well, in the case of the ones that we keep adding for updating, y is gonna equal whatever was already in y, so this right now, and then I'm gonna also add an extra string onto the end of it. Um, who, I don't even know, what's another name? Any name, Capybara? That's not one, but it did it, right? So it took the exact string it had before, it added a new set of information to it, and it keeps growing. This is really more about planting seeds. You know, I, I don't have any great way to show off how this is useful, but we will come back to this concept in the future. Um, so, okay, that 
so far, I think we've done a good job covering the primitive data types, just what's available, right? We can do math to numbers, we can do some, some string, some fun stuff with strings, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, we did some math, cool, cool, cool. And we discussed variables, right? Let's, um, let's shift away from just the console and let's get a super simple web page rolling. So I'm gonna make a new file in our, in our operating folder here. And I'm just gonna call it uh, demo4.html, right? So, okay, good. We're in a, we're in a space where we're gonna do it. We're gonna do all of our basic stuff. Thankfully, this page knows how to finish some things. Oh, it doesn't really know how to finish HTML. That, that's fine. But it does close the tags for you, which is great. Um, head, uh, body, and within body, let's go ahead and have us a script. I'm not gonna use it for anything yet, but I just wanna, you know, oh, it didn't, it didn't finish it, silly. Um, I just want to provide the framework there. Okay, what do we want in this body? Um, well, we want a header. Usually those are easy to work with, right? So H1, we got to give it an ID so that we can play with it, so we can do things to it. Um, ID equals thing, right? Uh, well, maybe I should name it something more conceptually relevant. So target, right? This is the target that we're going to try and do things to in the script. Hello, world, exclamation points. Um, okay, and that's actually plenty for now. This is a workable page. Let me, let's see, I forget how to do this in. Not open to the side. I guess you got to reveal in Finder is what I'll do. Uh, there you are, it popped up. And I'm just going to get it open into the web browser, right? Hello, world. Great. Uh, we'll leave the finder behind. Uh, okay, so let's pop the inspector right open and get over to the console tab. This element here is an element called target. It is it is a thing that we are going to try and retrieve and, and examine. Uh, this gets us into the concept of objects. Right, so um, how do we get in here? What is an object again? An object is a, a complex combination of all that kind of basic data we were just doing and some, some functions along the way. Um, so what do we wanna to do to this object? Well, we might wanna change some things about it. We might, might wanna change its, um, its, its it's <laughs> colors, sorry, I'm trying to drink my coffee and talk at the same time. Uh, we're, we might want to change its colors. We want to change its text. Uh, we might want to change its class. We can do all kinds of things to it in JavaScript world because we have access to changing the primitive information inside this object, right? We learned how to change variables just now. We can change all variables. So let's go ahead and get this object. How do we get an object in this world? Well, here's one, document dot get element by ID. The D is lowercase, I believe, uh, target. Okay, so, oh, I misspelled document. That's why I didn't autocomplete. Document is the DOM uh, in, in, this, in the browser world, right? We've talked about the DOM a lot in the lectures. Um, so document is the, the, main, the big object that is kind of our reference point for everything else that's happening inside and on the page. It has a method called, hey, go find me this ID. Go find me whatever object has this ID, right? And the ID we're looking for right now is target. So if I just hit enter on this, it returns the object. Wonderful, look at that. It, and the way that the, um, the console displays uh, objects that are elements like this is it just gives you the HTML code. That's really just, it's a, it's a display trick, you know, internally it's a, it's a object. Uh, but we didn't do anything just now, right? We just sort of returned the object and then it went into the ether. You know, if I just type 10, for example, okay, great. The console has returned 10. I didn't change anything. Nothing happened. I just returned it and it said, okay, cool. <laughs> We're good. 
right? So if we want to do things to these elements and objects, we usually want to just store them in a variable. So I'll think a new variable called elem. Um, well, I'll, I may be more explicit, element. The element I want to screw with is going to be contained in this variable. And we're going to say it equals document dot, and again, you can do some autocomplete, get element by ID. Yep, so tab will autocomplete when you see it. And then I'm going to get target. There we go. Okay, now remember, it says undefined because assignment statements do that. They, nothing is returned when you assign a variable. Uh, but element now contains, aha, look at it, it highlights it. It knows who it is on the page. It's wonderful. So this this variable element is pointing at all of the data associated with this page element. We can do things now. So for example, I want to return what's its inner HTML. Ah, okay, this is the text that we typed, right? If we go back to the source, that's the text between the opening and closing tag. So we can do element.innerHTML equals bananas. You know what? Bananas. <laughs> Look at that. We just changed something on the page live while the page is already up and running and loaded and such. We did things to it. We can also access its element.style properties. And there's a ton of things you can do here. You can get the whole style object or you can go to a specific thing within that. So I would like to do color equals. So what is it right now? We can actually see, I would normally say, oh, you hit enter and it returns it, but you can actually see the preview. There's nothing in the color st uh, style object. Makes sense, it's the default, right? Nothing has been changed about its color. Let's change its color. Um, let's change it to, we can do all kinds of things red there we go blue now remember these are the predefined names of colors that the system knows about we can also do custom ones like remember um red green and blue ff is max red green would would be zero zero so no green at all and then max blue what do we get we get that magenta bright pink kind of hot pink thing uh, we can also change, you know, background color. I'm, I'm just typing right in there. Oop. I misspelled a little bit. Okay. You can always tell if you've gotten the thing right if the, if the preview pops up. It's like, oh, yeah, I know that one. Uh, if I change the background color to the same thing, oh, no, we've just made a pink box. Uh, but uh, maybe I do the inverse, right? Zero, zero, F, F, zero, zero. This is going to look horrific. Here we go. Eh, I think it could, could look worse, but not very nice on the eyes. Um, let's go back to something more relaxed. Okay. And we can go, we can change the color again. Um, either, you know, there are a few ways to do this. What are we doing? What have we just been doing? We grabbed an element from the page and we grabbed its data object, right? We, we snagged it and trapped it in a variable that we have access to. And then we keep doing things from that variable, right? This is our sort of, we create the, the variable in this sense is like a doorway. We said, ah, I want access to whatever's happening to this element over here. Great. So we've, we've seen, you can change color, you can change background color. Uh, I could do, let's see, another one just to illustrate font size, I think you can change. Uh, let's do 48 point. Wow, look at that. It got real big. -na 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 -na. Yep. So we've we've. I, I hope this is showing how we went from this sort of abstract space of just like, hey, look, numbers are neat, to hey, look, numbers and strings mean things for this page that we that we have created, and we have access to changing all of them anytime we want on the fly. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to the notes real quick. We've messed with inner HTML. Yes, yes, wonderful. We got an object out of the page um, using the document .get element by ID. That is a that's a that's a strong one, right? Get element by ID is a primary tool. It's like a hammer in your toolbox. Now, 
there are better ways to get elements sometimes, but this is the most fundamental way that's easiest. When you know that you're going to want to do things to an element in your page, you give it some ID and then your script will be able to reach it easily, right? Um, another thing I, I guess I might want to cover there is element getting variable, uh, storing in a variable, but also, dang it, it keeps wanting to autocorrect. Um, but also we can just do it on, uh, immediately. And what do I mean by that? So we had covered the variable storing version. What do I mean by that? So um, what we did here is we stored this variable. We stored this, uh, this object for the target element in a variable. Let's make it bigger so we can see it. You can also document get element by ID. We can get the same element, but let's say we just want to do one thing once really quick. You can just kind of do it here, right? So, so let's say I want, we want to change the inner HTML. Why on earth would this work? Well, think about the structure, right? What does this return normally? Document get element, etc. It returns an object, right? What we then went on to do was store that object in a variable, and then we would call the variable and change things about it. Ultimately, this is kind of the same thing as storing it as a variable. You can call its parts, right? So document will go and get the object, and then, again, this little chunk of code, once it executes, it's it more or less is that object. So now we can look at that object's inner HTML right away. Oh ho, look at that. We see bananananananans. Let's change it right on the fly. Um, bananas spelled properly. Oh, wait. Bananas with a period. Very serious bananas. So this is just something you should see, right? I, I think this helps to illustrate the idea that objects and, and variable references they all are doing similar things, but variables just are very convenient for our code, right? It makes it very easy to keep track of something that you don't have to keep doing this kind of honestly monstrous amount of, it, it, having to retype this a thousand times is not your friend, right? Typically you're gonna grab all the variables you wanna mess around with, all the elements you wanna mess around with and store them somewhere first. Um, and as we see, you know, we can we can do things on the fly in a single line sometimes. So, one line we changed the the content of this thing. Cool. So, immediately on the same instruction. Okay. Let's see what else. What else up here? Um. Yeah. Okay. What else do I want to show you? All right, let's keep messing with this guy. Let's do something here. Let's uh, let's get a, a style block, and let's say our our target right uh, ID target. Wait, is that is it mad about something? What are you mad about? Is it because there's nothing in there? Um, so. One thing is, I, I don't want it to be the full width of the screen. Let's, we're just gonna make it 50%. Save it, reload it, see if it's okay. Uh, I guess that part is. I think it's clearing the way. Hmm, what am I trying to do? I'm, I'm really just trying to make it so that we can adjust it. Um, okay, let's, let's talk about, th this is a very useful piece of CSS that we haven't talked about before, positioning. So let's check out this element's uh, position. I think I'll go ahead and do it through... Oh, you know what? There is another way to, to screw around with stuff that I should show you. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. That's the style, this guy. We can actually edit the style stuff down here. We haven't done this before, but it's really fun and useful. I can say, hey, I don't, I want to turn off that width thing. So I just disabled the width definition I had. Okay. 
So if I re-enable it and we hover over, okay, we see exactly what that did. It changed the sort of the internal content. It didn't really change any of the padding. That's okay. That's fine. Um, let's add a couple of things. You can, you can add the things right here. Again, something to remember, the for the most part, by and large, everything you do in the interpreter console, or not the interpreter, the, um, the inspector, right? So the thing that contains the elements page and the console, it's all temporary. So we, we're going to mess around with things here. I want to change this thing's top position to... Nope, oh, come on. Let me do it. Top. Equal. Okay. So top colon... 10 pixels. Okay, nothing happened. Why is that? Because we didn't declare something that, that is important to do if you're going to mess with the positioning of objects. And that is position by default is uh, relative. Everything is is relative to the elements that, it, that are above it and it sort of positions itself. We want to change it to absolute. Okay, so now what's going on in here? We see this guy. What if we change the top position to a hundred pixels, a thousand pixels? Well, it's gone. <laughs> so it it updates on the fly. It's great. So what we're seeing here is the ability to change the position of an element. Interesting. Interesting. We can move things around on the page. Right? It's not just changing the color, it's not just changing the, the sizes and fonts. I mean, those are all awesome and important, but uh, it's also changing positions. We're getting into like interactive territory, weirdly interactive stuff. So, okay, we can change top, we can also change left. These are the two you'll see most often. So let's do 50 pixels left. Look at that. So we've given this, this element that we normally would see just sort of automatically stretch across the whole screen, Suddenly, it's in, it's floating in space. Position absolute specifically means I'm going to, it, it's still relative to its parent, I believe. Uh, but instead of it being sort of automatically calculated, the position, it allows you to say, okay, from my parent, in this case, the body, uh, I'm going I'm to situate myself exactly where I want to be, right? So using the top and left. Otherwise, top, left, bottom, and all these are ignored. So we have we're seeing that we can reposition things. Let's keep let's let's get it more like close to the middle of the page. As close as we can get it to the middle-ish. Well, in this case, it's not gonna be the middle middle. Uh let's do hundred. Okay, sure. All right, well, we've done this. Let's let's take what we've learned here in the temporary space and go and apply it up here in the in the code, in the style. So, position, absolute, absolute, top. What do we do? 50 pixels and left 100 pixels. Now, every time we load the page, it will be in that same spot and we don't have to you know, rely on, on finicky stuff. So, this... We're gonna mess with it. We're gonna really use this to mess it up uh, in a minute. So, but I just wanted to, to note some new CSS because I think it's a value, right? Um, let's see, what else can we screw with here? We'll deal with class names later. We covered objects, so. Uh, okay, before we move on to making this thing move around all willy-nilly in fun ways, I should have, I, I forgot to stop off and mention, um, we talk, again, we talked about all these in lecture, but I want to show you each one of them. So var x equals something, right? I would like to show you how arrays work. Sometimes you want to store several things of the same similar type or similar usage together. That's one, we can do another one that mixes things up. Um, John is one string. That's one value. Doe, that's another string. How old? 37. Uh, cause of death, bananas. Too many. I wish I could type. That would be great. Okay. I don't know why I defaulted to a mortuary report. It just kind of feels vaguely more interesting than the employee one they use all over the rest of computer science. We got a John Doe. He's 
37. He had too many bananas. This is a list of information that's all grouped together, right? Now, you could also do that in, in an object, right? Because that might be, make more sense. You could name these. But the point is that you sometimes you just want to store information together. Um, to get information back out or change it, we can say, let's, let's look at what value is in each position of one of these, of these um, what do you call it, variables, um, one of these arrays. X, I say sub, as in subnotation, zero, gets us the very first value. Y sub zero gets us the very first value. Now, why is zero the very first value and not one? That's an old school thing, you know, it, about the math of computers. Um, zero is the first value, if you think about it, right? Zero is the first thing that is available in the list of numbers. Um, so the next number is one. We'll, we may cover that in the future, we may not. Just remember that zero is always the first index, right? So we are indexing into the array. We're saying, give me the value at index two of y. So y index two is going to be 37. Now, why is it 37? Well, index zero is John. Well, we can, I guess I can do it. I can just type it. Index zero is John. Index one is Doe. And index... 2 is 37, right? We will see in the future why it's very cool that you can mathematically run through an array and do things, pull things out, add things, change things. What if I want to change something? What if I figured out in a dramatic twist that John wasn't killed by bananas? He was killed by hot sauce. Oh, man. Now, what happened? Did I change it? Why? I did change it. So arrays are, are mutable the same way that variables are. You can change parts of arrays. You can also change similar to the way you can change parts of objects. Objects are just a little bit more highly structured. Um, I can show you, so you can make sort of generic objects as well. They don't have to be the fancy kind that are built into the system necessarily. Uh, you can see an object here var x again I, I always name them x just to show it's it can be whatever you want it's simple here let's make it x x x x x x that's too many i won't remember let's do three now well, three is too uh that has a different connotation um x thing okay objects use curly braces so so whereas arrays use brackets the square brackets to represent things and commas to separate them I'm going to relabel that. Um, objects use curly braces, and they have this notation. Uh, first, colon, three, comma. What does that mean? That means there is a value named first, and it's and or there's a there's a variable named first, a property named first, and its number is three. Second, is Joe. Okay, x thing. Interesting. x thing dot first. Aha. We've seen this dot notation before, right? We see it in document. Dang, typing is hard, especially on a shitty keyboard. Um, document dot get oh element oh dot right. We just made a generic object and threw some stuff into it, but we're already seeing the parallels of, okay, document is really just a big pile of complex information named, uh, it has its ver it has variables, it has functions. Um, I mean, wow, you can dig in deep, right? Uh, this simple object I made is actually a fairly complex thing under the hood, but we don't have to worry too much about that. The idea here is that you can make objects just as much as you can make arrays, and they are both the same idea of capturing complex information together. When we when we change things about Hello World over here, um, get target, again, we're just changing one of the properties of the properties. So, so we have this dot operator which says, hey, give me the next thing. G give me the thing named this 
inside this. So document contains something named get element by ID. Now, in this case, this is a function. It's actually like it, it executes code. It's not just a number value. But in this case, it's it's an actual number. It's a value, or not a number in this case. It's a it's a string, right? So if I just get that, we see it's hello world. But remember, this is what we can change instantly to bananas. It's all bananas today. Some days it's capybaras, some days it's bananas. We changed it, okay. You're seeing now, I hope, that this is just an object, the same way that this is just an object, the thing that we made on the fly, and then get element by ID returns, aha, its own object. It returns the object here, right? So then we can go into that object and change its properties. Same way I can go into X thing and change second to hot sauce. Hot sauce has to have an exclamation point, of course. You digging? So this, oh, well, let me do X thing just to show you what's in there. Yeah, it's still second op entity has hot sauce. Now I called them first and second. You can name them whatever. Let's do our John Doe one more time. Um, poor guy, uh, var poor guy equals, um, we'll just make it a, this so now poor guy dot and I think you can do it this way first name equals John okay so now poor guy we just added a new property by assigning it right out right there it just was like okay I don't have a property named first name but now I do how about poor guy dot last name equals doe great Poor guy dot uh, age equals 37, the number. And poor guy dot cause of death <laughs> equals, um, and you know what? We already have it stored somewhere. We're gonna grab it from X thing, right? If we want the value from second from X thing, we would do X thing dot second. Why would this work? What does this do? What? Why could this work? X thing dot second contains the value hot sauce. Yes? Okay, so hot sauce is going to get assigned to the value of poor guy's property cause of death. Now, if we hit enter, okay, cool, it returned. What's going on in poor guy? Well, there it is. We have age 37, cause of death hot sauce, first name John, last name Doe. We're doing some good stuff. We we are jumping straight into editing the content of objects, which is huge in this world that we're in here, right? In this web dev world. Okay. I think I've done as much as we should do right now on complex object types or complex um, data types. Okay. What else should we talk about? Well, I think... I hope I, I got your interest when I said, hey, we're gonna really mess this bananas up, right? So let's reload the page. Um, nothing going on here. Let's talk, well, first let's combine what we've done here and we've been gonna move this up so it's more linear. Um, let's combine what we've done here into, sorry. So just changing the order I wanna do stuff. Um, Combine what we've done here with, with messing around with objects and messing around with, with uh, elements. And let's try and mess around with the position of this thing on the fly. Um, okay, so here is hello world, right? Here's our friend. Let's grab the object, var uh, l. We'll just do l for element. That's very common. You'll see that a lot in online code for ex like examples of things here. L equals, we're gonna get, we're gonna get our, our thing from the document again, document dot get element by ID and our friend is named target still. Yes. Okay. Um, L dot style dot top. Oh, it's not defined. How is that the case? That seems wrong actually. Fascinating. Um, L dot style dot top equals 200 pixels. I'm just trying something. Okay, it still works. I guess it's not defined because um, it's defined up here in the style. Uh, 
seems a little odd, but the, the fact is that this is how you can access the information here, right? Can I do L dot top? Not scroll top. top. Is it X position? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, here's the here's the trick. So we can L dot style dot top equals. What if I just do two hundred or uh, two fifty? No, nothing. So it needs to be plus px. Okay. And why does that work? Remember, a number plus a string combines the two. So as we're used to seeing, I think at this point, styles typically have a unit attached to them. So it's a number and a unit. We just need to make sure that gets in there. So I can continuously change the position of this thing. Um, el dot style dot top equals uh, three hundred. Uh, wait, I should do it in a string. Three hundred pixels, right? I think what you might be noticing by now is that this enables us to do almost animations, right? Um, in fact, let's add transition. Um, one second. Reload. If now if I change, let's go grab the element again. Var L equals that. Now if I change the element style, again, remember what transition does in CSS world. It says, okay, if anything about me changes, I am going to it's not going to change instantaneously. I'm going to smooth transition. Aha, uh -huh. it slides around. We can go to back to a hundred. Ooh, okay. You're seeing that we can do some fun animator, animative, <laughs> animation-y things using some JavaScript and some CSS on this object. Um, yeah, so that allows us to really, really muck around here. Um, let's see here. What else can I do that is valuable? Okay, let's get away from from this for now um we we've seen how to move things around it's cool oh you know what let me do it to the to the left as well just for fun left equals uh, 150 pixels Ooh great uh yeah okay now i would like to hold off and and just discuss, okay, we need to, if we're going to do something fun with this page when it loads, or perhaps in response to user behavior, we're gonna wanna do a script, right? So the script can be external or it can be internal. There is really no difference um, in terms of the, the code executed. It's just, the, it's the same code, it could be. And let me demonstrate that. So. Um, on, as soon as the page loads, you know, let, let's, let me go back here and steal from myself. I'm going to hit up and grab this definition. Control C to copy, control V to paste or command. All right. Why did I do that? Because I'm lazy, but y here's, here's the thing in programming. That is not a problem. <laughs> uh, that is actually a strength you are not supposed to work harder in programming. You're supposed to work smarter. And I'm not blowing smoke here. That's absolutely true. If you can save time, that means you can do better logic. You're not going to waste all your time typing the same document, dot, get, element, bot, you know. That's a waste of your fingertips. So copy and paste as much as you possibly can, right? Um, even the assignment for, for this particular demo in lab, uh, I ask you to do that because I don't want you to sit there and copy every opening bracket and closing bracket and everything. I want you to copy paste things and edit them. So what do we want to do right when the page loads? L dot style dot background color. We'll change it to that, that pink I use so often. Oop, didn't mean to enter. Okay. What does this mean? This means when the page loads, it's going to, oh, it'll define some styles, 
All right, cool, top to bottom. It creates the object and then it runs this script right, right away. So the script says, get the element data and change it. Okay, let's reload the page. Aha, now it didn't transition. That's a little annoying, I was hoping it would. But that's fine, we can see this object is pretty well, well structured. You know, I'm gonna change something about it uh, to make it just look slightly nicer. Um, text align is center and border radius is, I don't know, 10 pixels. Yeah, okay. Just seems a little more intentional, right? Not just accidental uh, uh, borders. Okay, so we look, we've run a script. We didn't even need the console anymore. We, we've put the code into the script here. I wanna just show you that there is no difference between doing this and creating a new script called script.js. Uh, did I copy those? I may not have copied them properly. I'll even control X them uh, and drop them here. Oops, the indentation's a little, a little aggressive. Um, okay, so now this is just an empty script. Let's let's reload the page just to show. Hey, it stopped working. Okay, good. So the the change that we make in the JavaScript doesn't run because this this page now has nothing to do with the JavaScript that we did. But if I then change this to have its source equals script.js, what do you think that means? Well, that means that this JavaScript tag, this this script tag, is going to. I'll even you know usually you open and close it right away. Uh, it's going to go straight out to script.js and pull in all that code, the exact same code, right? So if we do this and reload the page, it does it. Interestingly, huh, the transition happened. I can think of a reason that might be. I think it's because maybe when you load an external file, it, it waits until after uh, more of the page is loaded. But either way. Fun, interesting. I, here I am sitting here telling you that there's there's no difference and there's some very subtle ones, but I think the subtlety of this difference goes to show you that it is really minimally different. Um, so external script, same idea. I think for simplicity's sake, I'll just copy this and we'll go back and we won't we won't load the script externally. I just you know for the sake of the video. Um, but just know that it's possible and it's often very good to break up your code like that. Boop. I would like to indent you guys. Oop. I didn't click. I think you can actually highlight and tab. Yeah. Yeah. Tab and shift tab to move a whole bunch of stuff at once. Yeah. Actually that's, that's good to know. If you want to fix up your indentation, uh, VS code helps a lot by default, but highlight a bunch of stuff and shift tab or tab it changes the indentation automatically. Okay, so, do, do, do. So we've seen where to do, um, where to write your scripts and where to do things in the page and all that. Uh, workflow, all right, cool. Workflow is essentially just like what we're doing now, right? You, you are editing the code and you are reloading the page. Editing the code, saving, for, don't forget that, reload the page, try things out. And you know, you can, you can keep trying things on the console. You're, you're in a pretty powerful position when you've got a script that runs uh, the page here and the ability to mess with things within that script right here. Great. Okay, so what next? What should I keep educating on? We can maybe talk class names in a bit. Let, let's, let's get into events. Okay, so this element, hello world, all elements have events, but the more intuitive kind that has an event is our friend, the button. Oop, button, uh, change. Well, I've created a button right there up at the top. Now, why is it up there? Well, this is no longer occupying that space. <laughs> And because we said its position is absolute, it's no longer factored into the ones that move around by default. We could change this button's position. So let's actually, you know, let's do a little, little messing about. The button's gonna have an ID, the button. Um, and I will 
give it some more information. The button is going to have position absolute. I, I said that wrong out loud in words, absolute. That's not correct. And we're going to give it a top of, if, if the target is at 50 pixels and left is at 100, uh, then maybe this one should be at, I don't know, let's put it somewhere not perfectly centered because we're not going to get perfectly centered anyway. Top is 400 pixels and left is also 100 pixels. We're just going to move it down the page a bit. Okay, changes down here. Maybe too far. Let's do 200 pixels. All right, cool, 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 cool. Now, change is a button. Click, click, click. Nothing happens. Let's make it bigger. Width is, I don't know, 20% of the page size. Oh, huh. that's not much, given that the page is very scrunched. If I do this, yeah, they both change. Okay. Um, let me, uh, height is also... Uh, 50 pixels. All right, big old button, bigger button. You can also change the text. You know, we know how to do all that at this point. Uh, but it's a button, it's clickable. Technically, everything in the page is clickable. And we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But this is intuitive, right? If you want to make obvious to your user that, hey, this thing clicks and it will do something, you can really communicate that quickly in a button, right? You can make it so that this changes and does things when you click it as well, but this is more obvious. Okay, so we've done this. Um, we would like something to happen when the button, when we say change, right? So this is where we get into the concept of events. Um, events are things that happen on the page that we want to trigger code that we have written, right? You can write the code right in here, so on click, Let's say, um, what's something easy that we can do? We can do console.log hi, right? Oh, I've done something wrong with my, aha, aha. It has come back to bite me. Recall what I said before about nesting quotes, right? So when you're defining the on click behavior right here, if you, the, it's, you know, every attribute we use a string. Right? We use quotes to tell what goes on inside the attribute, right? In this case, I need to have a string inside the attribute too because I have to pass this string to the console log. Arr! So I guess what I should do is change these double quotes to single quotes. Look how it's not mad anymore. It says on click, do this. Oop, 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 I dragged. Uh, do... Can I get the double click? No, I can't. Um, do this whole thing on click. Before it was saying on click, do this and only this. And then it gets confused about, hey, why is there an H right after this? That's not how normally you would write HTML. Okay. So I hope that makes sense, right? You need to alternate usage of your quotes so that they don't get confused about okay so this is here is a string of information that i'm passing to the on click and then inside of that this is a string i'm going to actually pass to the log okay so again console.log is our old friend that allows us to throw things into the console real quick um this can be super good for debugging things let's just use it uh i saved this page i reloaded here Click. hi Hey, look at that. Now in the console, if the same thing happens multiple times, it sort of stacks them. You can see it has said hi to us now 40 times, 42 times for all the nerds out there. Um, so, great. We, we've got the button doing a thing. Cool. If we wanted the button to do something interesting to our friend up here, though, we're getting to a place where it would become pretty unwieldy to try and do a bunch of this kind of stuff in the on click. So what we want to do is define a function. Functions, function. Um, what do we want to do to this object? Uh, let's see. Let's say we want to change its uh, its font size. Uh, no, let's do something else. Let's do something interesting. Um, no, we'll just, we'll just stick with something simple like color for now. Uh, function change 
No, we'll we'll just we'll declare that the name of the function is just button behavior, right? Um, and we can define it. You could give it arguments, so you can make it so that kind of like console.log, you could give it something to do. Uh, in this case, we'll just give it nothing and just have it do stuff here. So in that scenario, I can embed this code so it doesn't run right away, but it runs only when the function button behavior is called. Okay, save that. Uh, now, I'm not gonna change any of this yet, just to demonstrate the issue. Button behavior doesn't magically know that it's tied to the button. You have to then say in here, call button behavior. Okay, fine. Over here, um, we can we can we can call button behavior ourselves. As soon as this page loaded, this function was defined. So now if you go into the console, you can say button oh, look at that. In the autocomplete, it knows we created this. It's a function. You gotta call it with the parens, otherwise it doesn't know you're trying if I just do it without the parens, it's like, let me tell you what that is. Cool, fine. But I'd prefer to call it with the parens to say, hey, do it. Do button behavior. Okay. And it did it. Button behavior was called by by us calling it right here in in the inspector in the console. And it did the thing. It grabbed the element and it changed its properties. Okay, now let's tie it to the button. How do we do that? Well, what do we want the button to do on click? We want it to do button behavior. Again, copy paste. Not even that hard, doing it. Okay, so this button now, let's uh, expand this page slightly. It doesn't really want me to do it on this interface. Okay. Uh, I can get out of space, I guess. Wow, wait, why is it? Oh, that enter was real, I see. Um, when you're, something I do a lot in HTML world is if, if it can fit on a single line, cool. I, I try to leave it on a single line. But once it gets to a point where you're like, like doing a lot of stuff in the attributes of an HTML object, um, I'd like to, to do this structure, right? Turn it back into uh, indentation with open and close, similar to the way you do it with like body, right? It just, you know, you don't want to be chasing it to the right as it gets for longer and longer and longer. Uh, you, you want to have it in a place that's clean and readable. And in fact, you can... You can do, I think you can do carriage returns like this. If you have, if you're doing a lot of different attributes, like as long as they, you know, again, white space, it doesn't really care about. Let's save and reload just to make sure I'm not lying about that. No errors. Great. So this is a button. And what does it do? It does button behavior because we defined a function that nice and cleanly allows this action to happen. Okay. So... What if we want to do the same thing here on click equals, oops, I'm, I'm being too froggy with that button behavior. Oh, ho! the same behavior I was able to trigger from clicking H1 instead. You can even give it to the body. Let's just give it to everything. Everything can have button behavior. Ray, great. If I click the body anywhere, oh, 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 wait, the body is actually just to, to show myself why I made that error. The body is only, only yay big. Oh, it's only up there. Why is that happening? Ah, I know why. And I'll explain it in a moment. The body by default is the size of whatever it contains, right? In this case, since we've said, hey, these two entities, I'm going to position them myself uh, as opposed to letting the default arranger do it. Well, the default arranger said, oh, the body doesn't need to be tall at all. The body can be height zero. <laughs> Let's just change that real quick. Uh, height is, we'll say the minimum height is 400 pixels. Let's reload the page and show you what, what that means here. So now if I hover over body, okay. Now body actually has a presence. Okay, so clicking the body does the behavior. Whoa, it did it. <laughs> it did the thing. Um, 
that I mean, this is great. So we, we have one function, but you could imagine how we might have 10 different functions doing 20 different things based on different places and clicks and such. Okay, so we've done buttons. Uh, we could do inputs and ranges. I, I fear that this is, might go too long if we if we do that. So I think you get the concept. You can give events to elements on the page. You can, you can define behaviors for those events. Um, I, I'll show you some more of this cool stuff uh, in, in one of the examples. I think we can jump to the examples now. Um, but just know that there are multiple kinds here. Yeah, you know, let's, let's mess with one of them. M mouse enter, double click, uh, etc. So let's make it so that on double click is the body and on mouse enter is the, tar the, the header itself. Reload the page. Okay. If I double click the body, it should change. If I click this, it should change because that's still an on click. This one, if the mouse enters the area, it changes. I didn't even click. I didn't even do anything. It just, it, I just hovered over it and ta-da, it changed. This is interesting. So on mouse enter, what about, oh God, I've done, I've done wrong there. Uh, let's do another on mouse leave equals uh, exit behavior. Now I haven't defined that yet, I'm about to. What's the exit behavior function? But uh, exit behavior var, well, you know what? Here's, a, here's a, something that will help in general. I have two functions, right? Um, they both kind of want to have access to this element, right? Uh, that like, but this one is only defined in this function. And I think var might make it available for everything else. But the fact is, this will have to have happened for this element to exist. I don't want that. I want this element to exist no matter what happens. So as soon as the page loads, L will get its, its object inside now. Now these behaviors can call on L without having to worry about whether or not it, it exists yet. So... Control C, Control V. I'm going to change the color back to white. Okay, what should happen? What have I done here? I've said to H1, it, when the mouse enters, do the button behavior. When the mouse leaves, do the exit behavior. Now, is it weird that I've called this button at this point? Yeah, it feels kind of wrong. Let's refactor it real quick. Enter behavior. Enter behavior. Okay, so now we have two kinds of behavior defined here. We'll get rid of the buttons behavior. Nothing happens on click, haha. -ha. And um, I guess I should show you the double click just real quick, double click. Oh, it don't work. Oh, because button behavior is no longer defined. Look at the errors I've been causing in the console. Button behavior is not defined. Why is that? Because I changed it. <laughs> there is no longer a function called button behavior. Okay, um, we'll just get rid of all of it, doesn't matter. I think you get the idea. Okay, so now I've defined two types of behavior. One is to change the background to, to the bright pink and the, the other is to change the background back to white. One is triggered on the mouse entering the area and one is triggered on the mouse leaving the area. Huh, huh. That should feel familiar from websites you've interacted with in the past. We've also just kind of recreated the hover behavior in, you know, the, the pseudo class hover. This is the kind of stuff that is actually happening under the hood when you say, hey, hey CSS, can you make this cool hover behavior for me? It says, sure, I can do that. And then it runs off to JavaScript land and actually implements it, right? We are working in the language that CSS tries to do, you know, above the scene. Look at that. Hover on, hover off. Hover on, hover on. even partway through, because transitions are, are friendly like that. Okay, <laughs> so we've done many a thing. Uh, we've done some on clicks, some double clicks, et cetera. Uh, inputs and change. We'll, you know, I'll, I'll delete things from this list as we as we decide not to not to do them. So okay, we have screwed around with many things now. Um, 
we talked a little bit about debugging. I, I mentioned it in the in the lab as well. We will carry on here. Um, I think we've we've touched on it enough to to get into it. Oh, functions. Uh, we didn't really deal with arguments yet. That's fine. For now, we'll just. The fact is, we did some functions. Great. Now let's get into my more colorful examples. Um, I'll show you some behaviors that we can screw with. Um, and we can try to walk, walk through the code. Now this will be fun because I haven't looked at this code in a while. I just know that these pages work still. So let's, let's get them open. Um, first is colors. Okay. These are cards again. You know what? I'll even change the background color to make it a little more obvious. Uh, body background color light gray. Okay, so I guess they don't start with any background color, do they? That's silly. We'll leave the background color white. Oh no, we'll leave it light gray. Uh, background color dark gray. Just want this to be more obvious. Yeah, cool. Okay. So this is just kind of demonstrating some events, right? Um, this background's color will change to a random color every time its click event triggers. This one triggers every time the mouse over event happens. Oh, how did I open my dictionary? Wild. Every time you go over it, right? Every time the mouse goes over it. But it also happens every time the mouse moves while it's over it. Oh, wait, that's actually not true. It's every time it moves over another part of it. Interesting. So the text happens to be a mouse over event as well. Mouse enter, this is every time it enters the whole region. Mouse leave, we've already seen when it leaves. Okay. Uh, double click, double click, double click, double click. <clears throat> this one, uh, this is every time the mouse moves. Now, you might it might have popped into your head at some point, how often can the events actually fire? Um, you know, that if, if the, these are happening kind of at individual little moments, clicking is a very intentional one-time thing. Events can happen very fast and watch. Whew, um, light light uh, photosensitivity warning here, but um, the idea here is every single time your mouse moves on this web page. It is throwing out so many events that just don't do anything. In this case, I have caught all of those events and said, hey, change to a random color. Okay, that's hard to look at. I guess I'll, I'll stop. Um, but that's that's kind of the idea, right? So we're seeing that events are pretty, pretty robust and they're happening all the time. It's just up to us to catch them, catch the right ones and do behaviors based on them. Um, this one is, let's see, why did I, oh, this one I think includes transition to make it like less bad for the eyes. So yeah, we'll inspect that in a minute. And then this one I like a lot. So these are three sliders. These sliders correspond to red, green, and blue. Why is that working? Well, we've discussed before that colors are just numbers, right? It's just three different numbers for the amount of each primary color in the interface. And this slider is just tied to a number. And every time I change this slider, it updates the color based on that number. Let's look at the code. Okay, we got some basic style up here. We see what's going on. Let's look at the first card. Okay, so class card, cool, 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 fine. This is the one that changes on click. So on click, we're gonna say this, oh, interesting. This is a way to get at an object without having to, um, without having to do the whole document document element by ID. If, if this element is the thing that triggers this event, it can just refer to itself, which is so wonderful, so good. This is something to keep in mind, ha, this. Um, Keep in mind in the future, right? This is maybe more more how that method is maybe more how 
often you will you will trigger events for for objects. So this object triggers this event. Uh, we can go right to its style and we can change its background color to hmm, random color. We'll have to look at that in a minute. But this makes sense, I think. Yes. Uh, on click, we change this thing's background color to a random color. Great. Other things we might want to look at. We have the slider card. Okay. Wow. That has a lot going on. Uh, this one. Okay. Yeah. These two, the mouse move ones. The only difference is there's a slight, there's a 0.5 second transition on the... That's too much. This is at least feels more natural <laughs> movement of color. Uh, okay, the slider card also has it has three input elements. They each have an ID. Um, they are of the type range. That's how you get an element like this that has slideys, right? Um, and I give it values, right? The the minimum value it, that's represented on the slider is zero. The maximum value is two fifty five because that's often the max. And by default, its value is 255. It may not surprise you to recognize that, hey, that value, as I slide this up and down, that value is going to change, meaning I can take that value and do something with it, such as update the slider color. Okay, before we get into the script, let's just look real quick at um, these slider elements. Hey, slider element, I just want to see what's going on with you. Can I see your current value? That is my question right now. Uh, maybe maybe it's not easy to see in this. Uh, well, maybe computed. Look for value, value, value. No, maybe not. Maybe not quite. Okay. We'll, we'll circle back to that idea. But the fact that, oh, you know what I can do? Um, what's its ID? Let's go to the console. Um, var slider one equals uh, document dot get element by ID. Since we're doing this from the outside in the console, we got to rely on our our document searching friend. But r underscore in is the name of this this guy. Okay, so this slider slider one dot value. There it is. We can see it. Slider 1's value is 235. What if we make it 100? Ooh. What if we make it 10? Oh, it completed 100. Aha! This slider's representation on the screen, the visual look of the slider, the interactable part of the slider, is determined by this number. This number that is part of its object. As soon as I change it, it moves. Fantastic. Do do do. Okay. So great. That's the kind of information available. How do we do all this? Well, uh, this is where we get into this. This is something I made over the course of like an afternoon a while back. And it's like a lot of taking data and trying to turn it into, um, turn it into color strings, right? Those color strings that we're used to. So hashtag F F O O F F. Foof. Um, we so hmm i'm trying to decide how how deep to get into this there's a random color function there's an update slide color function and there is a two hex string function meaning i can take three number values and convert them into the same form you know this this hexadecimal um so taking three numbers from zero to 255 and then turning them into the colors. We won't dwell here anymore. Um, uh, you know, you, you don't need to know exactly how all this works, but this is the kind of stuff that you can do with it's none of it's too crazy right here, right? It's a lot of, here's a string and I'm going to add it and I'm going to cut, I'm going to cut the strings up. I'm going to, I'm going to get some random numbers for each color, um, so let's let's show right now. Here's a friend. Math is one of the modules that's always loaded. It has its own object always loaded. Uh, Math.random. Not times four. Just random. Math.random gives a random number between zero and one. You can multiply that, for example, by 255. 
and get a random number between 0 and 255. Meaning, if those are the colors, so remember, FF means 255 red, OO means 0 green, and FF, again, means 255 blue. So we, essentially, if you can get a random number for each one of these, then you can construct a, a hexadecimal string that works, right? So that essentially is a lot of messing about changing these numbers and, and such. And, you know, I had to do some tricks like, oh, shoot, the numbers aren't coming out right. I got to make grab the floor of that number so that it rounds down to the nearest whole number, etc. Again, we, we won't dwell forever here. But the idea is using just some math and string screwing around, you can get a random color generation function going. And in fact... I know there's a much cleaner and faster way to do it. I just did the verbose way so that if anybody was curious, they could look at it. Okay, I'll let me linger on this for a moment for each of it. In case you do get curious, you can at least pause the video and look at each of these lines. Uh, I'll scroll down a little more. Getting to, wait, well, I'll, I'll make sure the top of each function is here. So two hex string, update slide color, and random color. Okay. And also all of the uh, card codes here. We got on click, on mouse over, on mouse enter, on mouse leave, double click, etc. Cool, 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 cool. Okay. A similar one. Well, not really similar in, in every sense, but another, another oddity I've made. <laughs> I would call this a fidget fidget box. Uh, this is called mouse, mousebox.html. What does mousebox do? Well, it does stuff in response to the mouse. When I when the mouse enters this area, suddenly this box starts tracking its position. It's red in this upper corner. If I go down here, it changes to blue. You notice that it's a little bit smooth, so I assume we're using some transitions here. <clears throat> Again, I haven't looked at the code uh, in a long time. So, like seriously, I have not. So this you'll you'll have a fresh take of me re re understanding what I spent my time on so long ago. But you see, can, do you think you could make sense of how to do something like this, given what we know so far? We've got on mouse enter. We we know that on mouse move is happening all the time. So every time I move the mouse, I could call something to to update the properties of this this little box inside of here. Um, and you know we know how to make rounded edges. That's that's just border radius. That's that's on, that's clever on its like, not even clever. It's just its own thing. Um, the colors, uh, there's only four happening. We got orange, blue, red, and green. Do, 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 do. Um, and another thing that happens is when you click, I change it. So that everything's brighter, different colors. Why? I don't remember. <laughs> Honestly, I think this was just me sitting down and saying, what kind of like vaguely interesting interactive thing can I make? Um, it's almost... It's like two parts fidget spinner, one part like abstract art exhibit. <laughs> so look at that. Look at the tiny gates. Okay, and you let go and it goes back. And when you leave the area, it shrinks back to its default gray centered state. If I click, no, nothing happens. But if I, oh, there is no default centered on the, on the clicky one. Okay, what in the heck is this? Uh, first of all, it's nothing. <laughs> it's just a, just a silly box. But let's look at how it works as much as we can. I've got a lot of CSS. I'm just like sort of styling everything, trying to make it look clean. The body is there's the square container. Oh, that's actually the 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 style. Uh, style is. Oh. That probably shouldn't be called style, should it? That seems wrong. An old error. I think it should be called ID. Yeah. Yep. Reload. Oh, all it did was change its position slightly. Okay. I bet there was that was an error from long ago that I never fixed. Cool. Okay. We have the square spot, the thingy in the middle that moves, ostensibly. Oh, no, no, no. Incorrect. Square spot 
is here. Let's pop open the inspector elements. We have square container. That's the whole world, I guess. Everything, I mean, it's it's within the body, but it's it's its own whole space. Okay, square spot is the is the thing where the square lives, and then within that we have the square itself. Okay, so square spot and the square. A lot of uh, style stuff going on in it. Well, that's great. So, how do I make this happen? Well, what happens? What actually does the thing respond to? We have on mouse move, we do waggle. Ooh, and we pass the, the event itself. Why would we do that? Well, we may, we may not dig into that, but on mouse leave, we call the reset function, and then we, we call the uncircle function. I think that's what undoes the clicking circle. If I do on mouse down, that means if I'm clicking and holding the mouse down, we call the circle function. And on mouse up, meaning when I let go of the mouse click, we uncircle it. Okay. There is so much here. I think what we're going to do is focus on the, the circle and uncircle is cute, but it's not even really core here. Um, reset means okay, we're going to get the target. We're going to grab the document. That, we're going to get the square. Okay. And we're going to set the square's style. Uh, it's width to 50%. It's height to 50%. And it's background color to light gray. Those are its defaults. So every time reset is called, meaning every time I leave the area, it just says, hey, turn it all back to the way it was. Here I go, here I go, leaving the area. Okay, it went back to 50% width, 50% height, and light gray. 50% of its container, and it's light gray color. Great. What else have we done? How does waggle work? Okay. B -b 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 so you, I, what I'm doing here, and again, I, I only want to kind of skip across the surface. I don't want you to get intimidated by like, oh my God, what is all this crap? Um, what I'm doing here that's that's kind of the clever move is that events are objects too. So on mouse move, moving around, yes, yes, yes. That's an event. Let me do something... Um, Ah, console.log event. You know what, I'll, I'll do it inside of the code just so I can make sure it looks good and works works correctly. So right at the start of this waggle, I'm gonna do console.log e. e is the name of the event. We're gonna find out what's inside the event object. So right now, nothing nothing's gonna pop up in the console because there are no on mouse move events happening because inside of the box where I'm where this behavior happens. As soon as I go in there, it's going to start dumping out events. Oh, oh, look how many events. Oh, look how many events it dumps out. But remember, these are just our old friend, the object. What's in this object? Lots of things. <laughs> but what are the most interesting things in this object? The things that I actually use in this in this fidget boy is the X and Y positions of the mouse. Now, why would I want to use those? Well, what am I doing to this object? I'm changing its width and its height to track with where the mouse is, roughly. Yes? So if I'm changing its width and its height, I need to know where the mouse is on the screen. How do I know that? The mouse's position on the screen is an X value and a Y value. So how far over is it and how far down is it? Or maybe up, it, it's different. But the point is like horizontal location and vertical location. So by every time this event happens, every time the, the waggle event is triggered by me moving the mouse over this, this area, here I'll close the console so it doesn't freak out. Um, I'm able to grab the X and Y position of the mouse from that event, right? So the, the event happens because I'm moving, you know, this is just how it works. And I can get the data and then use it to change the, the visual object on the screen, right? I can get into a little circle down here. So that I think is as instructive as I would like to be. Again, I, I will, I'll do a slow uh, pass of this code. I could also post it online, but I'm not sure if I will or not. Um, just so you can look at everything if you want to. Here's the waggle function. Here's the first part of it. 
a lot of just basic calculations. I mean, I'm not doing anything uh, crazy pants, but um, I'm going to reset. And the others will get circle and uncircle. And that's, that's what we'll do. Okay. I think that's plenty for now. We've done lots of good stuff. Uh, you'll learn about changing class names in the lec or in the, in the lab. It, it's the same concept. You know, if I can change the properties and I can change the internal text, why can't I, you know, slap a new class name onto the thing too and watch it change? Um, you'll see. But that's it, I think. Uh, this, so this is our this is our demo. Do do do. We'll go back to our demo. Change it. Change it. Oh right, the change behavior no longer works. I killed it. But there we go. We're using JavaScript to change things on a web page, and I hope you're starting to see how powerful that is. Right? It, it's the ability to do anything to any of the data on the web page. It's not relying on the system anymore. It's really us taking control of the whole, not the whole web browser, but most of what the web browser does in this window. We are just grabbing hold of it and doing whatever the heck we can do given our, our current skill set. And the hope is that skill set continues to grow. So, great. Um, that, that's it for now. Thanks for coming along. And um, take care.